7. And as we look at Ezra chapter 7, we're in kind of the uh, later part of this book, and then we're going to go through chapter number 10. And really what we see all through the book of Ezra is that life can be a series of ups and downs. Um, in Israel's history, Solomon had built a magnificent temple to God. Uh, that was kind of the hype of the kingdom of Israel. David uh, had, had been this magnificent king. He had won great victories. He had defeated enemies. Is, uh, Israel geographically was at about its largest size. Uh, he wanted to build a house for God. He wanted to build a temple. Uh, but God said, no, uh, because thou hast been a man of war, but your son can build the temple. And so uh, David got, gathered all the materials. He had everything ready to go. And then during Solomon's reign, Solomon built this magnificent temple to God. All the sacrifices were offered. The people worshiped God. They praised God. Sadly, though, the children of Israel did not continue to follow and serve God. And so as you study the kingdom history of Israel in uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Those, those six books give us the record of the kingdom period of Israel's history. And we find that there were many times that more often than not that the king who reigned over Israel, it said that he was an evil king, that he did wicked in the sight of the Lord. And so the, the children of Israel, they had those ups and downs. There would be some good kings and they would be some bad kings, but the truth is there were more bad kings than good kings. And then the prophets, we have what we call the major prophets and the minor prophets. Uh, major prophets, not because they were more important, but they're called the major prophets because the, the books that they wrote were, were larger. They were, it was a larger volume of work. And so uh, Jeremiah, 50-some chapters, Isaiah, 60-some chapters, Ezekiel, 40-some chapters. And so those are considered the major prophets because of the volume of their book. The minor prophets were much shorter, sometimes just a few chapters, sometimes just a, a single chapter or maybe two chapters. And so because of that, they were called the, the minor prophets because the, the books were much shorter. And those prophets many times uh, were writing contemporary with the kings. And so even though they're separated by a great deal of space in our Bible, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther come before the book of Psalms. So it's, it's kind of in the front half of your Bible. And then you turn right to the middle of your Bible and you've got Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Uh, but those messages were taking place at the same time. And so uh, all of that is just important for us to understand that all of this that was going on in the Old Testament was really going on kind of all at the same time. And so Jeremiah, God sent Jeremiah, and this is how God would send a prophet. God would give the prophet a message, and the prophet was to go to the people and give the message. And so uh, it's similar today how a pastor uh, prays and studies the word and God lays a message on his heart, and then I, I stand up on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night, and I, I give the message that God gave me as I studied and I, as I prepared, I give the message to you. The prophet, though, had a word directly from God. Many times, the words that the prophet gave were word for word what God gave. And so God gave a message to Jeremiah Jeremiah was to go to the people, and essentially, Jeremiah, and, and this is really condensing 50-some chapters, but Jeremiah's message, if we condense it down, it's you need to repent, and you need to get right with God. That was the message. And if you don't repent, God is going to judge, and God is going to allow you to be taken into captivity and to be in bondage to another nation. Well, the children of Israel did not repent. They did not listen to Jeremiah's message. And so the second half of Jeremiah's message comes to pass. God allows them to be taken into captivity. It was Nebuchadnezzar. It was the nation of Babylon that goes in, overtakes Israel. And they're in captivity. They're in bondage. They're in Babylon for 70 years. And Jeremiah had said, and Daniel had said, that that's how long it would be. It would be for 70 years. One other thing that I think will help us to understand uh, the book of Ezra as we finish up our study of it is the Ez uh, book of Ezra it covers a time period of 90 years. 
And so we just read in chapter 7 about Ezra and about the king, Artaxerxes. But if you go back to the beginning of Ezra, chapter 1, it talks about the king and it talks about Cyrus. And so it actually, there's three kings that are mentioned in the book of Ezra. Uh, Cyrus is where the book opens. In the middle of the book, we read about a king named Darius, and then the, the king Artaxerxes here at the end. And so it covers a time period of 90 years. Uh, the, the first half of the book, or really maybe the first three-fourths of the book, Ezra is giving uh, a historical record. Ezra was not even born when Cyrus the king gave the original decree. And so Ezra's writing this book later as a historical record. This is what has taken place. When we get to chapter 7, Ezra is now alive and he's writing about himself and he's writing about the decree that he got and the rest of the book, chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10 are going to be the time period that he was alive. And so the book opens with Zerubbabel leading the initial group back, starting the work of rebuilding the temple. Now this sounds like just a historical record But by application, this book is so important because we too have lives that have ups and downs. Sometimes we're doing good, sometimes we're not doing so good. Sometimes God sends a message that is to get our attention. It might be a a sermon that we hear, it might be a lesson that is taught, uh, it might be a, a person that says something in our life, it might be a situation that's going on in our life. But God is sending a message that he might get our attention, that we might turn back to God. And so even though this is historical and even though this took place thousands of years ago, by application, it's true for every one of us that there are times that we must come back to God. We, we allow things to slip. We allow things to, to get out of sorts. And we need to come back and we need to start the work again. And so the first four chapters... They cover a time period of two years, two years. And it it very specifically tells us that in those two years, they went back to build an altar and to build the temple. Uh, They didn't build walls. Uh, God had got their attention while they were in captivity. The most important thing in my life right now is that I rebuild my relationship with God. They, they knew that the, the altar was the most important thing right then. You know, sometimes in our life, it's good for us to remember the most important thing in our life, what really matters is that I have a right relationship with God. It, it doesn't really matter about my job situation, uh, not even so much what's going on in the country, but the most important thing right now is that I have a right relationship with God. Why? Because people and circumstances can cause us to get out of sorts, and we can lose a right relationship with God. And we need to restore a right relationship with God because nothing is more important in your life, nothing is going to affect you more in your life than saying, I am right with God. And I'm not just talking about being saved and knowing that you're going to heaven, but saying on on a daily basis, I know that as best I can, I'm in a right relationship with God. I'm trying to seek him, and I'm trying to live for him, and I'm trying to be led by him. And if that's not the case, then you need to get back there and say, God, I want that again. I want to be led by you again. And so those two years are super important. We find out that after those two years, the the foundation was laid. The temple was being rebuilt, and, and, and it sounds like at the end of chapter 2 that things are wonderful, that things are great, they're praising the Lord, uh, the work's going forward, and then it stops. It stops. We preach a message on opposition about how uh, the devil opposes us, and the work ceased for 14 years. Uh, the next chapter tells us there's 14 years where nothing got accomplished. I think we could say when the, te- when the foundation was laid and they got the temples being rebuilt, that's an up. When 14 years and nothing happens, that's a down. Right? We have ups and downs in our life. We have times where we're, we're going to church and we're involved and we're getting things out of the preaching. And we have other times where we go to church for 14 weeks and feel like we didn't get anything. We'd have to be honest enough with ourselves to say that's a down. I am not where I ought to be with God. And, and David prayed and said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I want to enjoy being saved. 
I want to enjoy serving the Lord. I want to enjoy living for God. <coughs> Excuse me. And that we would get back right with God again, that we would be doing the things that he wants us to do. And then uh, last week we pointed out how that God in his mercy, he uh, has a message. And the message is, the messengers this time are Haggai and Zechariah and and, and Haggai's message, really a very clear message. He said, you've, you've built your houses. They'd been there 14 years. They were not living on, on dirt. No, they had been building. They just quit building God's house. They'd been building their own houses. And Haggai spells it out just two chapters in his letter, at chapter 1 and chapter 2. And in chapter 1, he says, you've, you've built your houses, but God's house lies in waste. You've not, you've not done anything for 14 years. And here's the message. It was very clear. It was very simple. It's time to get back to work. It is time to get back building God's house again. And so God gets uh, the message through to them, through Haggai and Zechariah, and they, and they get back to work. When we get to chapter 7, nearly 60 years have passed. Now that's, uh, that, that makes things in the Bible sometimes hard to follow because you're reading through here, uh, two years pass, okay, uh, it takes a while to build some things. If you've built a house or you've done a remodel, it always takes longer than you think. And uh, we're building a building right now and we've been, uh, the ground, we've been doing all the site work and they finally are pouring the footers and uh, this week they dropped off the perma post and I believe the crew is supposed to be here this week to set those. And, uh, but a lot of it is just say, we just want to see it done. We just want to see the job completed. And so they're working and they're working. And, 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 and then 14 years, the work ceases. It's, it's like having all the materials on site. It'd be like if we just stopped our building program right here. And for the next 14 years, we drove in and we saw that pile of block and some piles of dirt and some unfinished work. Can you imagine how discouraging that would be? It'd be difficult to come to church for 14 years and see the pile of dirt and the pile of block and, and things not smoothed over, grass not growing. We'd say, what, what is going on out there? Now, in a, in a project, we can understand that, but sometimes in our own personal life, we don't see the connection. You see, sometimes in our own personal life, we've got some piles of block and we've got some piles of dirt where we've dug up some things, but we don't really have a real relationship with God. We're not really spending time with Him. Uh, we're not really uh, reading the Bible. We're not really inviting our friends and telling our coworkers about church and trying to get them to come. We're not even that faithful to church ourselves. We, we come sometimes, or we come when we can, or we come when it's convenient, but we're not really serious about living for the Lord. And Ezra here, this book is, is about far more than just the people going back and rebuilding the temple. It's really about God wanting to rebuild our lives and about God wanting us to be busy uh, serving and living for Him. And so the rest of the book as a reminder to continue serving and living for the Lord. Ezra says, here's my message. My message is we've had a lot of ups and downs. We've had times where we were doing good, and we had times where God was judging us. We had times where we were obeying God, and we had times where God's trying to get our attention. And you know what Ezra's saying? He's saying we just need to continue to live for the Lord. Now, in truth, there's always going to be some ups and there's always going to be some downs, but the idea is they shouldn't be so drastic. It shouldn't be that we're living for God and then 14 years and nothing happens. Really, in truth, it shouldn't be 14 weeks. I understand there's times people get sick, there's times something happens, but when it's weeks upon weeks, we say something is not right. If you've went an entire week and not read your Bible, Something is not right in your relationship with God. If, if, you've not, if you've went months, a couple of months, and you've not invited anybody to church, you've not given a single gospel tract to somebody uh, telling them, hey, I want to invite you to my church, something's not right. right. We've got to be honest enough with ourselves to say, am I doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing? Am I serious about living for the Lord, or am I just kind of going through the motions? And so this is a book about rebuilding and determining to stay close to God 
and to grow in your personal relationship with Him. All right, kind of a long introduction. Uh, let me get into the message here. Number one, it takes time. It takes time. That's what we see in chapter number seven. Uh, chapter number seven tells us 57 years have passed. It takes time. 57 years is a long time. In 57 years, there are people that are born. There are people that pass away. There are people that move away. There are people that change the whole direction of their life. 57 years is a long time. You know, it reminds us that life is bigger than you or me. The, the brevity of life is a good teacher. Uh, Job chapter 7, verse 7, Oh, remember that my life is when mine eyes shall no more see good. Job chapter 9, verse 25, Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away. They see no good. You know, the story of Job. Job was uh, a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. And, and God uh, is talking to the devil. It's a very unusual account in the Bible where we have this interaction between God and the devil. And it's recorded for us. God says, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil essentially says, well, he only serves you because you're good to him. And so God kind of removes his protection, and he allows the devil to attack Job. He, he takes away everything that Job has. And Job, the Bible says, he, he retained his integrity. And so the devil, he's talking again with God, and he said, well, it's, you, you took away those things, but, but you protected him. And so God uh, removes his protection from Job, and he says, you can't kill him. But, but the devil gets as close to killing him as he can. He makes him physically miserable from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. He is covered with these painful boils. And Job here, he writes in chapter 7, he said, My, my life is when life comes and it goes. He said, My life is like a post. They, they deliver and, and they're gone. The passing of a loved one or, or a funeral has a way of putting life in perspective. You go to a funeral and a person's entire life, maybe 60, 70, 80 years, summed up in what we call an obituary or a eulogy in about one to two paragraphs. 60 to 70, 80 years down to two paragraphs. Tells where they were born, tells if they were married, if they had children, maybe where they worked, where they graduated high school, a few of their interests, names people in the family that preceded them in death, and then those that survived them. And then you say, they've, if they were saved, they've went home to be with the Lord at this many years of age. That's it. All of life in just those couple paragraphs, and all of a sudden you realize life is quick. Life is quick. And my life is passing by. And maybe you begin to ask yourself this question, am I living my life for something that matters. What are people going to say about me at, at my funeral? What will I be remembered for uh, by my loved ones? What would they say my interest and my hobbies? Am I living for something that really is going to matter? Another takeaway is that God has a plan and his plan will be accomplished just a few verses, 57 years have passed by. We're reminded that life goes on. But while uh, we pass on, God still has a plan. God had a plan for Cyrus. God had a plan for Darius. God had a plan for Artaxerxes. In the beginning of the story, it's Zerubbabel that takes the men back, the initial group that goes back. Now in chapter number 7, 57 years have passed. Zerubbabel's time is gone. Now God's going to use Ezra. You know, that tells us there were people before us that God used. Right now, God's using us, and in the future, God will have others. The, kind of the cycle of life, if you will. Then we notice that you can do right even in difficult circumstances. You know where Ezra comes from? Ezra comes from Babylon. Now, uh, there, uh, Babylon's no longer the ruling power. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, his successors were weak. And we mentioned how Persia uh, was, was lifted up and Persia overtook Babylon. Cyrus is the, is the world ruler at that time. That's where the book begins. But there's still a Babylon. Many of the people are still living there in Babylon. Uh, Fifty-some thousand had went back with Zerubbabel, but most had stayed behind. And so Ezra, when we're introduced to Ezra, Ezra was, grew up, was born 
grew up and he was living in Babylon. I point that out to say that many times we falsely think that most godly people will come from the most godly circumstances. But that can be true, but it's not always true. It's not always true that the most godly people come from the most godly circumstances. Here's a heathen nation, and yet in Babylon, God has Ezra. And God has a purpose for Ezra. And God is going to raise up Ezra. And Ezra is going to go back to Jerusalem. And he's going to take another group. And he's going to be the one that God uses. And he's going to be the one that has the message. He had a right relationship with God, even living in difficult surroundings. I don't know about you. For myself, I, I think that America is changing. I think that America in many ways already has changed. And it, it's troubling to me. It's, it's troubling to see how many things have, have changed and how quickly they've changed. And, and I personally feel like this election that's coming up in, in just a little over a week is probably the most important election we've ever had. I, I believe that. Uh, I, I believe it's important that Christians vote. I, I believe it's important that we vote as a Christian, that we don't vote for a party, but we vote for what people believe. And a Christian, when we see that people are for abortion or against abortion, that should matter to us. Right? Abortion, according to the Bible, God is the giver of life. And so if we take a life, whether it's inside the womb or outside the womb, the Bible is clear on that, that it's murder. And so as a Christian, we would say we have to take a stand that I can't in a good conscience vote for someone that would be for abortion because I'm not for abortion. And then we uh, vote on things that, as we see that they relate to uh, gender identity and say that's, that's not right. The Bible teaches and the Bible has taught for thousands of years. It hasn't changed that, that God's the one that defines that a person is born a, a boy or a person is born a girl. Those things ought to matter to us, and we ought to be informed, and we ought to consider what people have voted for and what their record is, and that ought, to, that ought to cause us to go out and vote, and it ought to cause us to vote a certain way, say, I'm going to vote by my morals, and I'm going to vote by my convictions, and I'm going to vote based on what I, what I stand for. Amen. But then let me follow that up by saying, regardless of the outcome of the election, because I don't know who will win the election. None of us do. We have an idea of who we think might win the election, or we have an idea how we think it might go, but we, don't, we do not know how the outcome's going to go here in, in a, just a little over a week. But here's what we do know. Two things are true. Number one, life will go on. Right? Life will continue. No matter who wins the election, Life will go on. Number two, here's the second thing that we know. We can live godly. No matter who the president is, no matter what happens in our election, we can choose to live godly. Amen. Ezra, Ezra was born and Ezra lived in Babylon. He, didn't, he wasn't raised in, in Jerusalem. He wasn't raised in Israel. He wasn't born uh, 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 in, in his homeland and, 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 and in Israel where God's people were at. And the temple hadn't been rebuilt. No, he was born in Babylon. But he had lived godly. And you and me can live godly. No matter who the president is, we can live godly. And no matter who the president is, life will go on. The key is found in verse 10, we read in our text. Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. He prepared his heart. You know what we need to do every day? Prepare my heart. What does God have for me today? What am I going to do today? Prepare my heart to seek the Lord. You know, we prepare our heart for an election. We prepare our heart for work. We prepare our heart for a game. We ought to prepare our heart to seek the Lord. Say, God, you have things going on. And God, you have a plan. And God, I want to I prepare my heart to seek the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel. Ezra was there to hold them accountable to either get back to a right relationship with God or to maintain a right relationship with God. I, I'm thankful for people in my life that have held me accountable. 
whether that was mom or dad, whether that was grandma or grandpa, whether that was a Sunday school teacher, a junior church teacher, a youth pastor, a pastor, people that God put in my life that were there to hold me accountable. Do I have a right relationship with God? Do I need to get a right relationship with God? Or I need to maintain a right relationship with God? As somebody that reminded me, I need to read my Bible every day. You know, some of us need to be reminded that we need to read our Bible every day. You need a pastor, you need a teacher that'll stand up and, and remind us that we're to pray, that remind us that we're to give the gospel out. You say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so nervous when it comes to inviting people to church and giving them a gospel track and telling them about something that's coming out of our church. You know, the truth is, I get nervous too, but it does not relieve us of the responsibility that God said we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so I might be uncomfortable inviting people to church, but I need to do it. Why? Because I've been commanded by God to do it. And that's not as a pastor, that's as a Christian. God commanded all of us to preach the gospel to every creature. We have a responsibility to our co-workers to invite them to church. We have a responsibility and an obligation to our, our classmates at school to invite them to church. Uh, to people that we don't even know, people that are strangers uh, to us, but say, God put it in my heart. It felt like the Holy Spirit said, invite them to church. I have a responsibility to, to tell them and to share the good news. Ezra had prepared his heart. Number two, not only does it take time, but it takes others. It takes others. Ezra started with a, a men's meeting. He, he, he's going to gather together the men. Now we're in chapter number eight. In chapter number eight, God had used Haggai and uh, Zechariah, but now God's going to speak through Ezra. And we can think back, and maybe you think of a Sunday school teacher, or a pastor, or a parent, or a grandparent, someone that God used in your life, but it may be that that person, they're, they're no longer here. You say, that, that person has went on to heaven, and so we can't rely on them anymore because it's not, not their turn anymore, it's not their time anymore. You know whose time it is now? It's our time. The time is now, right? The time is now. This is, this is our time. This is my time, and it's your time. And, and it won't be long. Life will pass quickly, and, and, and our time will be up. And it'll be the next generation's turn. That's why we try to emphasize young people so much, and we have teen activities, and we have youth activities, and we're trying to... Why? Because we know that our, time, our time's limited. It's not forever, but when God's done with us, He's going to raise up another generation. And Ezra here, he, he goes to the men, and he's going to speak to the men, and he's going to try to gather men. Why? Because Zerubbabel had men that helped him, and Ezra realized he had those, he needed those to help him. God often sends a message that's particular to a specific situation in your life. And, and I, I feel like for time's sake, there's so many things I, I want to say because I'm trying to put so much into this last message and, and don't want us to be here all afternoon. But God has a message that's specific to your life. So many times, personally, I've been going through something or I've had a question about something, and God gave a message specifically that I needed. I could recount times. I remember Viola and I uh, went to a, uh, a large meeting, and uh, there were literally probably a 1,000 people at the meeting that night. It was, it was preachers from all over the country. It was lots of Christians from that area, and they were going to have multiple preachers that night. And actually, by the time we got parked and got in the building and got seated, they had just started the service. And uh, Viola, she hates being late. It makes her real uncomfortable. Not that I like being late, but it really, she really hates being late. She gets embarrassed real easily. And she's like, oh, they've already, they already started singing. I can hear them. And so we're trying to slip in as like unnoticed as we can. And we, we actually slipped into the balcony. That was kind of the easiest place to get seated in that church. And, and we squeezed in some seats real quick, and we sat down and try, tried to be as inconspicuous as possible, coming in late, you know. And, and, and they finished that song, and they announced the first preacher, and he got up. And I am not kidding. We had been praying and praying and praying. Uh, some things were going on, and we just felt like God needed to do something. And, and that preacher began to preach, and it, he probably wasn't two minutes into the message. 
And I thought that is exactly the message. I, it, there, there were going to be a lot of other preachers that week, and, and they were all good messages, but I didn't need any of the rest of them as much as I needed that first one. And, and God worked in my heart. God had a specific message. Now, I, I mentioned that there were a thousand people because I'm sure somebody else in that auditorium got something that night. But you know who the main person was that got something? Me. I needed something, and God gave me what I needed. And, and God has a specific message at specific times in your life. God knows us well enough to feed us right where we're at in our life right now. God knows. He knows your life. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you need to hear. And he, he knows when to give us the message that we need. Now, with that considered... So many times here at Good Shepherd Baptist Church, we talk about uh, we need volunteers. We need more people to help with this. We need more people to volunteer with this. If we don't have enough volunteers, do we think it's because God's not speaking to people's hearts anymore? I wonder here at Good Shepherd Baptist Church if we'd say, okay, we need, we need volunteers. We need more people to help, maybe Sunday school teachers or junior church teachers, or, or we need people in the bus ministry. You've heard us say that a lot of times. We need helpers in the bus ministry. We need people that will sing in the choir. Do, do you think we don't have volunteers because God's not speaking to people's hearts anymore? I, I believe God still speaks to people's hearts. Now, it's, it's very pointed, what I'm saying this morning, but I believe there are more volunteers in the church that God's speaking to that just haven't, haven't done it yet. God, God's burdened their heart. God spoken to them during a message. There was a time where they thought, maybe, is the Holy Spirit speaking to me about doing that? Does God want me to do that? But then you leave and you just kind of put it out of sight, out of mind. God's still speaking to hearts. I wonder if, if no one comes to a day of outreach. Now, I don't know that we've ever had a day that no one has come, but we've had days that we've had special outreaches. Maybe only 20 people have come. Do I think that, that God did not speak to anybody else's heart about telling people about the good news? You know, I, I think if I, if I ask you to raise your hand, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but if I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you are glad somebody told you how to be saved? We'd all raise our hand, right? Well, I'm thankful somebody told me how to get saved. The lady that uh, shared the gospel with me, she was a Sunday school teacher, probably not the first time, but it was the, it was the day that I responded. It was the day that I realized I needed to be saved. And I raised my hand, and she took me out, and she opened up her Bible, and she showed me how I could be saved. And that day, I prayed right there on a stairway with her Bible open. We bowed our heads on that stairway, and I asked Jesus to come in my heart and save me. And I am thankful that she told me how to be saved. And you know what? Paul said, I'm a debtor. I am a debtor. That's the way the Apostle Paul lived. I need to tell other people because someone told me. And you know, I can relate to the Apostle Paul. Someone told me. And I feel like now I am a debtor that I need to tell other people. And I don't believe that we have a church service where the gospel is preached and we talk about sharing the good news that God's not speaking to people's hearts and that while the preaching is taking place, people are saying, you know what? I do need to invite my coworker. I do need to invite my classmate. I've never, I've never went across the street and ask my neighbor to come to church. I've never invited them to church, and we've lived here five years, and I've never asked them to come to church yet. God speaks to our hearts. I don't think it's that God's not speaking to our heart. I think that sometimes we're just not listening to the message that God has for us. If we don't share the gospel with anyone, do we think it's because God's no longer speaking to your heart? There have been times that I've been at a, at a gas station putting gas in my car, and I've, I've said many times here at the church that if you're standing across the, the gas pump from someone, uh, you, ought to, you ought to take a moment to invite them to church. If you go to a, a, a Walmart or something, you ought to invite that person to church. You go through a drive through you ought to invite that person to church. You know, there have been times... That while I'm sitting in that drive through line, it's like the Holy Spirit was saying, Brandon, won't you invite this person to church? And you know what? I've done the same thing that you've done. I've started making excuses. 
well, they're probably busy. They've got a lot of other customers. They probably already go to church. We get all these reasons. It's not that God's not speaking to us. But it's that we're, we're arguing with the Lord and we're giving all these reasons. But Ezra said it, it takes others. He found a lack of spiritual leadership. Let's look down at verse 15. I'm going I'm to hurry here for time's sake. He says, I gathered them together to the river that runneth to Ahava, and there abode we in tents three days. I viewed the people and the priest and found there none of the sons of Levi. He was looking for, a, 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 in that case, a priest, and he found none. You know, God's still looking for people today. It's a, it's a biblical principle. Proverbs 26, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Jeremiah 5, 1, run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know and seek in the broad places there. If, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment. Ezekiel 22, 30, I sought for a man among them that they should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God is still looking today for people who will seek him first. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know what God's doing? He's looking through Good Shepherd Baptist Church, and he's looking for someone. It doesn't matter what age, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter what your last name is. He, all he cares about is somebody that will seek him. God is looking for somebody that will seek him first. Number three, we've got to be clean. We've got to be clean. We need to, we need to seek God's face. That's the starting place. Down in verse 21 of chapter 8, he said, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. We cannot, be, we cannot pretend to be serious about God while we're playing church. You know what I'm talking about when I say playing church? You know, going through the motions, putting on your church clothes, Maybe, maybe singing the songs while Brother Marshall's even, you even smiled when he said rejoice. You smiled real big. Look at me, I'm rejoicing. And, and we do all those things on the outside, but God looks on the inside. You see, the, the act that we do at church, it might convince other people. It might convince your spouse. It might convince your mom and dad. You, you might be able to convince the people that sit around you. But the truth is, God knows whether you're serious about him or not. We can't pretend to be serious about God while coming when it's just convenient or easy. I don't mean this to sound mean. I, I just really, for time's sake, I'm, I'm trying to say the things that I, I think God wants me to say this morning. And I'm trying to say them kind of as brief and as clear as I can. But, but we can't be serious about God when, when we're just coming when it's convenient or when it's easy. You say, well, I came to church Sunday morning. But what about Sunday night? What about Sunday school? What about Wednesday? What about reading your Bible during the week? What about praying during the week? What about, and, uh, what about inviting people to church and telling people about Jesus? Uh, what, what about giving to the Lord's work? There's all these other things that God requires that God is looking for and us being serious about Him. Are, are we serious about coming to church or we say, I'm just, I just kind of, I'm doing, it, I'm doing what, I, what I can do. I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm coming as much as I can. I'm, I'm coming when it's convenient. I'm coming when there's, there's nothing else going on. That's not real serious about church. Our, our son, Job, and, and Annie, too, they, they both played basketball a lot. And I used to always tell them that, that you, you really get better in the off season, right? When, when everybody else is on summer break... Uh, that's when you can really excel and you can become a better player so that when next season starts up, that's not the first time you picked up a basketball. And, and Joe, man, he took that to heart when he was a little kid. And uh, he would work hard during the summer. He'd be dribbling the ball. He would be shooting. He would be doing drills, not, not playing pickup games. I used to tell him all the time, I said, Joe, I hate pickup. I don't care if you play pickup. I don't care if you go. And, and I don't want to get too much on basketball. But, but just, I, I said, that, that's not going to help you be a better player. I don't care if you play pickup games or not. I said, you need, to, you need to work at getting better. And so he would do drills and he would do exercises and things to strengthen him. You know why? Because he was serious about basketball. If we're going to be serious about church, it's not this kind of one and we're done. 
No, it's, it's how can I be serious about living for the Lord? How can I be serious about my relationship with God? How can I be serious about growing spiritually? How can I be serious about leading my family in the right direction as a, as a Christian dad? I'm going to be serious, and our family is going to be serious about living for the Lord. We, we've got to be clean. We've got to seek God's face. We've got to separate to God. Separation is often viewed as a negative perspective when we preach separation that we're to separate we're to be different we're we're thinking it means that there's things that i i can't do separation is really more about separating to than it is about separating from now as you separate to god you know what's also happening at the same time you are separating from the world because as you get more serious about god it's not so much that you're separating from your friends but a lot of times people are going to start separating from you they're going to say, oh, I don't know if I want to spend that much time around him. It seems like every time we're together, he talks about God. It seems like every time he, we're together, he's talking about his church. It seems like every time we're together, that's all, he ever, that's all he ever cares about. And they kind of start distancing. But it's not so much what we're separating from, but it's what we're separating to. Say, I want to, I want to get close to God. I want to spend time with God. It, it's not so much that you say, I don't want to watch television, but you say, I... I spent some time reading my Bible tonight, and I don't even think we turned the television on tonight. Well, that's getting serious about God. You know, we're more serious about a television show than we are about this book. We're, we're more serious about a movie than we are about prayer. Hey, this is, this is real life, right? That's what Ezra was saying. Ezra was saying, we got to quit doing this, and we need to kind of, we need to get some things more consistent in our life. We've done the cycle enough. We need to break the cycle. He was, he was giving them the history of, of their nation. Then let me give you the last one. I'm kind of skipping some stuff, but I know I tried to put a whole lot into this message. I don't, I don't want to give you too much that you don't, you don't miss it. The last thing he said, stay close. Stay close. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. Ezra was simply reminding them of the past. We, we're into chapter number 9 here. Let me read just a couple of verses. Verse 7 of chapter 9. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. The message must be repeated, God will judge sin. Ezra had to give that message. It, 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 Zerubbabel had given the message. Haggai had given the message. Zechariah had given the message. Ezra gives the message, God will judge sin. But here's the, here's the great truth in this chapter, Ezra chapter 9. God gives us the opportunity to judge ourselves. You know what God was doing? God was saying... If you don't judge yourself, I'm going to judge because sin has to be judged. But here's really the choice. You can judge yourself or I can judge you. And so God sent Ezra with this message. It was very similar to the message that Haggai and Zechariah had. It was similar to the message that Jeremiah had. It's similar to the messages that we hear today. It's yet another example of the mercy and grace of God. You know what the question is for you and me this morning? Is there an area of your life that you need to get right with God? That's the question, right? The, 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 the God's speaking to us. God's clear in his message to us. God says, if you continue in sin, I've got to judge sin. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God will judge sin. But if I first come to God and say, God, I'm sorry. God, I shouldn't have done that. God, would you forgive me? God, would you help me uh, to, to break that habit? God, would you help me to break this uh, cycle of sin in my life? Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, David said, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. David was saying, God, search me. God, you show me if there's something that, that should be in here that's not in here, if there's something that shouldn't be here that is here. God, you judge me. And then it was a call to obedience. Simple obedience in the beginning 
can keep away generations of heartache. I know I've given a lot this morning, but let me say that one one more time. Simple obedience in the beginning can keep away generations of heartache. Sometimes others have to pay the price for your disobedience. Well, that's a thought to consider, isn't it? The choices that I, might, that I make, they may not affect me. It may be that it'll affect my kids. Your choices may affect your grandkids, your co-workers. The, the, look at the list of the nations in Ezra 9.1. Uh, it says here, and, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. You know what that verse tells us? They were getting in trouble everywhere. Sin was multiplying. Sin was growing. And sin always grows. But the Bible is a book of good news. So let me end with the good news. Look at Romans chapter, or Ezra chapter 9, verse 13, and we'll, we'll finish the message up here. Ezra chapter 9, verse 13, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and hast given us such deliverance as this. I said it just a moment ago on the last point. I'll say it again. It's yet another example of the mercy and grace of God. He punished them less than they deserved. Again, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but I think all of us could, could raise our hand this morning and say, God's punished me less than I deserved. I had more coming to me than what he's given me. He's punished me less than I deserve. Now, don't misunderstand that point. Don't leave and say, well, pastor said we can do whatever we want because God will punish us less than we deserve. No, the Bible says in Romans 6, verse 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We, we don't, just because God is gracious, that doesn't mean we go out and live however we want. It means that we live for him. Ezra challenged his people to not go back. Let me ask you this, this morning, which cycle of sin do you need to break in your life? The, the challenge for us today is not just to hear the message. No, the challenge is to allow God to change you. Allow God to change you. The children of Israel were affected by the message of God. In chapter 10, now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And to simplify a serious point, when confronted by God, we have one of two choices. We can repent or we can try to cover it up. The people here of Israel, they, they repented. They got right with God. When God speaks to you, which will you do? Let's go ahead and stand this morning, if you would. ask you to bow your head, close your eyes just for a moment. We're going to have our pianist to come, and our pianist is going to...